So I'm going to ask you guys to just think about milk for a second. What comes to mind? Maybe the fact that you're almost out of your gallon at home and need to go to the grocery store and pick up some more. Or maybe that it sounds really good with some cookies right now after dinner. Well, we've gotten really used to the idea of milk as food. We started domesticating dairy animals like cows and goats and camels about 10,000 years ago. And in those 10,000 years, we found lots of different ways to use milk as food. And cheeses and yogurts and ice cream. Um, and it's a beverage by itself. But milk is also special because milk is what makes us mammals. In fact, we as humans belong to a class of mammals, a class of animals called mammals, based purely on the fact that we have mammary glands that make milk for our young to, to, uh, to drink during infancy. And, but tonight we're going to talk about milk as more than food, and how milk contains special immune compounds that not only help the, uh, that not only provide nutrition for the infant, but also provide it uh, for, for protection from disease. So tonight we'll talk, start by talking about the recipe for milk and what goes into it. We'll then go into talking about milk as support for the developing immune system. And finally, we'll talk about uh, the applications of milk and the immune compounds in milk um, as actual medicine. So as I said, Milk is what makes us mammals, and for all mammals, which is a large group, a class of animals, um, they make milk for their young. And even though the recipe for this milk varies, the basic components are the same. Milk has water, fats, sugars, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. And all of, and these things are everything that a young infant needs to survive and grow and develop in the first few days, weeks months, or even years of life. Now, when we start to look at specific recipes for milk, sometimes we find that even among very diverse groups, or diverse species, milk looks a lot the same. So humans have a very high proportion of water with relatively little fat, protein, and sugar. Um, zebra milk is also the same, uh, very similar. Um, but the reason that their milks look the same has very little to do with the fact that all milk looks the same, um, but rather that that milk is good for their environment. So humans nurse infants for several months or even years. So they need to be able to make a lot of milk over that time. Putting a lot of water is kind of a cheap way to do that. Zebras live in Africa where it's very warm, and so they want to make sure that their infants have enough hydration. Now, just because you can have very different species that have similar looking milk, doesn't mean that all milk is high in water and kind of low in these nutrient components. Hooded seals, for example, have very little water in their milk, but very high fat components. And this is because hooded seals give birth on ice flows, which are very unstable. So they'll only nurse for about four days. But when you think about the environment that hooded seals live in, with lots of ice, it's very cold, they have predators like polar bears, they need to be able to transfer a lot of energy to their to the young right away. We can also see that uh, very closely related species have very different kinds of milk. So actually just last month, um, there was a paper published on naked mole rat milk. And they expected that naked mole rat milk would look a lot like their mouse cousins. Kind of Lower in water, high, high in fat and, and protein and sugar. Um, but what they found was kind of surprising. They found that uh, naked mole rats actually had milk that was very high in water and low in these other constituents because, uh, and they, they suspect that this is because they are naked. And they lose, uh, in their arid African environment, they actually lose a lot of water through their skin. So we've talked a little bit about what the nutrient components of milk are and how they can vary among species. But what if I told you that babies can't actually digest everything in milk? For example, oligosaccharides are complex sugars, and humans lack the enzymes to break them into simpler sugars that we can use as food. Yet, they're the third largest component of human milk. If we eat food to give us energy, to do things like run, grow, um, and reproduce, 
If we can't digest something by breaking it down into simpler parts, it can't give us energy. So why, as evolutionary biologists, we ask, why would mothers go through all the trouble of spending time and energy to make something that wasn't digestible in food? Well, we suspect that the answer has something to do with the fact that milk may not originally have been food. In the time before mammals, synapsid dinosaurs laid eggs, which were porous. And it's hypothesized that they secreted immune fluid onto their eggs from specialized sweat glands. And this helped protect them from disease and keep them hydrated. So the implication of this is that it, the first milk might not have even been food at all. It might actually have been specifically for protection against disease. So, so far, we've talked about that milk is the first food for mammalian young and contains all the nutrients they need to grow and develop in early life. But that not everything in milk is designed to be food for the infant. Early dinosaurs laid eggs, which may have been protected, which may, may have been protected with a special immune molecule sweat that became milk during the evolution of mammals. So in the next part of the talk, we're going to talk about how milk can be a support for the developing immune system. So, or why do babies need immune support from mom anyway? Now we know that being a baby is dangerous. There are warning labels on all kinds of um, all kinds of products, like plastic bags. Um, we have childproof caps so that babies can't open pill bottles by themselves. But the reason that all of these common items are we think are, are dangerous for babies is because babies are ignorant about what they should actually be doing with them. And the same could be said for um, being, a baby, uh, being a baby is also dangerous because babies explore the world in ways that explore their developing immune systems to a lot of potential germs. And like the babies, their immune systems don't quite know what to do with these potential germs. Now, you may have heard the myth that babies are born without immune systems. And this isn't true. Their immune systems are, uh, the development of the immune system actually starts before birth, during the third trimester of pregnancy. Shortly before the, uh, the mother gives birth, she starts to transfer antibodies from herself to her infant through the placenta. At birth and after birth, the infant starts to get protection from immune molecules in the milk. Uh, but this, the infant's immune system can only develop through exposure to pathogens in the world. Um, so the protection from milk is a good way to bridge that gap as the infant starts to, and, and its immune system starts to develop and get exposed to pathogens in the world. So how can, we, how can milk help during this time? Well, the, the immune system needs to mature through experience. It needs to learn to recognize danger. So while the infant might not know that a molecule from a peanut is not as dangerous as a chicken pox virus yet, the mother's immune system will have already figured this out. And so by passing immune molecules from herself that have already seen these things to her infant, she can help share some of that knowledge. Infant's immune systems also can't produce defenses quickly. So even though an infant's immune system might recognize a pathogen, the pathogen might be able to replicate um, and cause an infection before the infant's immune system can respond adequately. And uh, milk can help by delivering large amounts of these immune molecules um, directly and quickly before the uh, while the infant is building up its own immune responses. So we've actually known that milk can help protect against disease for a long time. The first antibodies were discovered in milk in 1903, and in the 1930s, public health studies found that infants who were breastfed um, compared to using formula had lower rates of respiratory infections, gastrointestinal infections, gastrointestinal and other infections. So this started public health campaigns um, promoting breastfeeding. Um, around this time, it was thought that milk was protecting infants purely by <coughs> through what's called passive immune protection. And so 
the mother was delivering molecules that acted in the infant, um, kind of independent of whatever the infant's immune system was doing. Today, we understand that the milk might not just be passing on passive immunity. It might also actively be educating the infant about the environment that it might encounter, encounter as an adult. So we think that the environment, through nutrition and disease, um, and the mother's previous exposure to microbes, sends signals to the mother. And the mother then chooses, subconsciously, um, what molecules to put in her milk, and those send signals to the baby's immune system about what it should, uh, how it should prepare um, to have its own independent immune system. Now we're also able to use some of the new uh, genomics, proteomics, um, and other large-scale technologies to further understand what's actually in milk. We know there are hundreds of different independent compounds, and until recently, we haven't been able to deal with large sets of data like this. So what are some of these hundreds of compounds that are in milk? Well, broadly, we can think about um, some of the big ones are, are general immune proteins. They're, they're part of the innate immune system, and they provide a general defense against bacteria and viruses. Um, some examples of these are lactoferrin, which binds iron, which, while it's an, an important nutrient for babies, is also uh, very important for bacterial growth. So by binding to iron, uh, this protein prevents bacteria from accessing that iron and, causing, and, and being able to grow and cause an infection. Another important molecule in milk are antibodies. And antibodies are made by the immune system in response to germs that it has encountered. So when a germ enters a person, it sets off a cascade of reactions that activate B cells. Um, and some of these B cells go on to begin producing antibodies right away. And some of them be called what's, become what's called memory cells. And these memory cells hang around in your body with the memories of specific pathogens that you've encountered in your past. And this memory of previously encountered diseases is how vaccines work. Now, there are many different kinds of antibodies uh, or immunoglobulins. Um, so some of these kinds include secretory IgA, or SIgA, um, IgG, and IgM. Pictures will go here. Uh, and these different forms of antibodies have different jobs in the body. Now, the most common type of antibody in milk is secretory IgA. And secretory IgA is really good at defending mucosal surfaces. So the mouth, the lungs, and the digestive system. And this is also the most common, uh, these are also some of the most common sites of infection for, young, for infants and children under five years old. How do the antibodies protect the infant? Uh, one way is by binding to uh, these, anti these milk antibodies bind to the pathogens so that the pathogens can't enter the infant's system. Another way is that these antibodies flag uh, pathogens as invaders that need to be destroyed. But these are short-term defenses. And what scientists have wanted to know recently is, do milk antibodies help in the long term? So some scientists did an experiment and asked uh, and built, a, uh, built a, a mouse model. They had a group of mice that were able to produce these antibodies in their milk um, and a group of mice that were not. And in the, the group of mice that were not able to produce the antibodies, they found that their gut microbiota looked like children who had inflammatory bowel disorder, which is an inflammatory um, pathology. They also noticed that they had, these mice had increased expression of genes that are associated with inflammatory bowel disease in humans. Whereas the, mouse, the mice that, had, that did have milk antibodies had better intestinal barrier function, which meant that pathogens were less able to physically get, their, get to the inside of the mice. Um, and they had healthy adult, healthier adult gut microbiota long after they had finished uh, long after they didn't wean or stopped consuming milk. And to return to 
the human milk oligosaccharides that we talked about earlier, they are the third largest component of human milk, when they're complex sugars that can't be digested by humans. But they can be digested by our gut microbiota. And uh, the gut microbiota is such a complex subject, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here. But if you're really interested in it, you can come to our next Science in the News lecture on date and time. Um, but what we do know is that having, uh, that your gut microbiota has a lot to do with your, with your health. And so by having um, certain types of uh, microbes over others, um, we can understand that we, this can tell us something about how healthy or not healthy you're likely to be. Another role of uh, milk oligosaccharides is that they can act as pathogen decoys. So all of these complex sugars are built of the same five building blocks. But they can be, like Legos, they can be arranged in different ways um, and act as decoys for specific pathogens, like different bacteria or different viruses. And so HMOs are complex sugars that are made of more than one simple sugar. Um, and so to put these simple sugars together, we need enzymes, just like we need enzymes to break them apart. And so gene, uh, if you don't have genes for certain enzymes, you or if you don't have alleles that code for genes with certain enzymes so you can't make those enzymes, then you can't make specific types of HMOs or you can't make as many of them. Um, so it seems that at least some of these are, are genetically controlled that determines how many and what kind of can make. Yes. Are you talking cross species here or are these all humans? Within a species. Within a species. Okay. So now we'll move on to the last part of our talk. Um, thinking about new questions in milk research and applications for milk as medicine. So, so far we've focused on the infant's immune system and how it grows and develops through exposure to infect its environment in early life. But the mother was once a baby herself and her experiences shaped the development of her immune system. And those experiences likely shaped what ended up in her milk. And we know that these experiences are probably different for different women because not all of the diseases that we see, we don't see all of the same diseases everywhere in the world. We also know that people have different lifestyles and different diets. So should we expect the immune molecules in milk to be the same around the globe? Well, this is the, this is the question that my research project is trying to answer. So, I'm interested in collecting milk from around the world and comparing the composition of the milk to environment and diet. So collecting milk from all around the world is kind of an ambitious project. <laughs> so I'm starting with a couple of places at a time. Uh, and one of those is right here in Boston. So last summer I invited moms to come into our lab uh, right next door at the Peabody Museum and give me milk samples and talk a little bit about their childhood, their adulthood, if they've been ill recently, um, all these things that we might expect might tell us something about the immune molecules in your milk. Now, I also um, head over to Poland um, and work at, at a rural farming village at the Mogilica Human Ecology Study Site. And so, one of the questions that I, I get asked is, well, you're hundreds of thousands of miles away from your, your lab at that point, so how do you collect milk outside of a lab? Well, it starts with loading up a suitcase with everything that you might need to collect milk, <laughs> not leaving a lot of room for your clothes. Um, and then once I get to Poland, I spend a lot of time walking around and just asking people, do you know of any moms in the area who might be interested in participating in my study? And then very similar to what we do in Boston, we talk to them about their lives. It's a farming village, so we ask, did you live on a farm growing up? What kind of animals uh, do you have right now? Did you have as a child? Have you been sick recently? Um, and we also collect milk samples. <coughs> and we weigh the babies uh, before and after. This is me weighing a baby. Um, so that we can, they breastfeed to try and estimate how much milk they're eating. And so, why these places? Well, they have very different lifestyles. Here in Boston, we're surrounded by lots of other people. And we often don't see any animals except our pets. 
But in this area in Poland, most people are farmers, and people see chickens, cows, and horses every day. This is my field assistant, Anya, <laughs> talking to a cow that we ran across on the, that we ran off, uh, ran into on the road. <laughs> so that would never happen here in Boston. So we're going to these places because we want to know: Does the environment matter for what is milk? If so, why? Is it the diet? To is it the diet? Is it exposure to other people, or is it exposure to animals? I mean, we don't have any answers to these questions yet, but we're going into the lab to find them. Um, and new technologies make this a really exciting time to do uh, milk research. So proteomics is the large-scale study of proteins. And it's been a really quickly growing area of research lately. And one of the questions that researchers who are doing proteomics and interested in milk ask are, what are the proteins in milk that we didn't know about before? How can we measure many of them at once? Um, and this gives us leaps and bounds forward in understanding what's in milk. And as we start to understand what's in milk, we can start to develop medical applications for it. So now we're going to talk about milk as medicine. So we talked earlier about milk antibodies and how they're transferred across the placenta, uh, or, and how some antibodies are transferred across the placenta during the last uh, trimester of pregnancy in order to help protect the infant soon after it's born. Well, premature babies miss out on some of that third trimester, so they receive fewer antibodies from mom during pregnancy. And this puts them at higher risk for infections such as necrolyzing enterocol enterocolitis, which sounds really scary. Um, and it is. Because necrolyzing means tissue death, Entero and coal refer to the small and large intestine, and itis is inflammation. And so what you should take away from this is this is a really bad gut disease. <laughs> and it can have, and it's rare, and it can be successfully treated in many cases, but it can also have side, uh, side infections and even cause death. So clinicians and doctors are looking for ways that we can prevent infants from getting these diseases, so we don't have to worry about curing them. And breast milk might actually help prevent these diseases uh, neck from even occurring. So doctors looked at, a popular, uh, at premature infants that were in the neonatal ICU. And they uh, took infants and they looked at infants that, had, that ate different amounts of breast milk during their stay in the neonatal ICU. So everything from infants who didn't have any breast milk at all to infants that all they ate was breast milk. And they looked over the first three months in their stay in the male ICU to see how many ended up developing neck infections. And they found that the more milk that an infant consumed, the less, uh, the fewer infants in that group that ended up developing neck. And so this suggests that breast milk might prevent the disease, and many hospitals are now encouraging breast milk for premature infants. But milk might be medicine for more than just babies. Do you remember the, the mice that we saw earlier um, that had, where we looked at mice that did and did not receive uh, antibodies when they were uh, in milk? The researchers who did that experiment wanted to try something else. They wanted to see if this, uh, if antibodies matter throughout your life. <coughs> so we know that adult immune systems are making antibodies all the time. And so they took two populations of mice, both of which received antibodies when they were, when they were small, through milk. And then some of these mice could produce those antibodies when they were adults, and some of them couldn't. And this bottom condition is looks a lot like what happens um, in people who have inflammatory bowel disease and other related conditions. They're not able to continue to produce as many antibodies early in life. And they fed both of these groups water that had uh, a chemical in it that could cause damage to the intestines. And they looked and they saw that mice who were still, uh, who could produce antibodies had, were better able to repair the damage caused by this water than the mice that didn't have the antibodies. 
So, to them, this suggested that antibodies are important in the gut throughout life. But, the <coughs> way that we could think about treating this is by isolating antibodies from milk and then reintroducing them uh, and then feeding them to an adult in a purified form. And by replacing these antibodies, we might be able to see some of these uh, better repair um, and healthier guts um, as treatment for disease. So there have also been some surprising discoveries about milk. So in 1995, some Swedish researchers wanted to know if milk would prevent bacteria from sticking to cells. And so they decided to test this in two populations of cells. They had some normal skin cells and some tumor cells. And they added bacteria, and then they added milk to see if this would prevent the bacteria from sticking to the cells. But what they were really surprised to see was that the milk actually killed some of the tumor cells. But it was not harming the normal cells. And so sometime after that, they identified this milk, this milk molecule that was killing tumor cells. And they found that it was a combination of a protein, alpha lactabumin, and a fat, oleic acid, that had combined. And they called it Hamlet. And so Hamlet works by entering tumor cells, uh, and by entering bacterial and tumor cells, and damaging their DNA. Oh my God! And so it actually damages the DNA so much uh, that the cell can't survive and commits suicide. Which just goes to show you Hamlet's involved. It was really tragic. Um, and happy birthday, Shakespeare today. Seriously, is it Shakespeare's birthday today? It is Shakespeare's birthday today. He's 450. So maybe something that's tragic for bacterial cells can actually be good for us. So the next question that researchers wanted to know is can Hamlet kill tumor cells outside the petri dish? And so they choose to, chose to look at this in, uh, hu with human skin papillomas. These are fairly common, um, but they're benign or malignant, so they're not cancerous tumor cells. But the current treatments uh, include, the current ways to treat human skin papillomas include cutting them off or freezing them, uh, things that can also destroy healthy tissue. So they recruited people who had skin papillomas. And they asked them to either apply a Hamlet solution or salt water every day for three weeks. And at the end of three weeks, they found that the tumor cells actually started, that the tumors actually started shrinking. And that these effects lasted for up to two years. Um, so the papillomas didn't grow back, and they didn't report any negative side effects of applying the Hamlet solution. So, this might be one potential therapy um, for, for treating at least surface tumors. But what's a tumor killing molecule doing in milk? That's definitely not food. Um, well, during infancy, the gut is growing rapidly, and that means that cells are dividing many, many times, which creates opportunities for error. So Hamlet might regulate cells that divide too much um, before they become tumors. But where does all this, where, uh, so we've now seen three ways that human milk could be used as medicine. With premature infants and preventing a gut infection, antibodies, potentially as a therapy for inflammatory gut diseases in adults, um, and Hamlet in cancer cells. But where does milk for these treatments come from? If you're a premature infant, you might be able to get your milk from your mom. But one of the issues with giving milk to premature infants is that the third trimester is not only important for getting antibodies from mom into the baby, it's also really important for breast development and preparing for lactation. So if infants are born too early, um, moms might have problems lactating um, and might not be able to, pro to provide milk for their infants. So one option is milk banks. And there are several milk banks uh, around the country, including one in Upper in Newton Upper Falls, Massachusetts. Um, there, are, there are also probably some milk banks that 
are associated with hospitals and not on this map. Um, but compare this to the number of blood banks in the country. So the bottom line here is that the milk supply is not unlimited. So because of this, some families look to the internet to get milk for their infants. And so just last year, um, some researchers purchased milk online as if they were families. And they collected uh, comparative samples from milk banks and tested both sets for bacteria that could potentially cause infections. And they found that for every type of bacteria they tested for, there was more of that bacteria in, in the milk from the internet than from the milk bank. Um, so, because currently, milk that you can purchase on the internet isn't regulated. So there's no one standardizing how you store it or ship it. Um, so until we can get those measures in place uh, to make sure that milk is safe, we need other options. And one of the immediate ap applications of doing milk research is improving formula. So before formula, animals' milk, such as cow's milk, was used as a breast milk replacement. But the first chemist to look at breast milk in 1760 um, found that it wasn't the same as cow's milk. But it took another 100 years before someone patented the first infant food, which was designed to look chemically more like human milk than cow's milk. And so after the, after the first infant food, there was an explosion of different brands, and you could have a choice of over 30 brands by the time we got to the early 1900s. Um, and in 1915, Nestle was advertising that their infant food was so nearly like mother's milk. <coughs> Today, we realize they were still missing vitamins, minerals, protein, and there have been a lot of improvements since then to regulate how we produce, uh, how we produce formula and what goes into it. So today, we know that you have to have certain levels of protein, fats, vitamins and minerals of where the products can't be labeled as infant formula. But there are still many ways that we can improve formula um, and that people are, are looking to add some of these biological and bioactive factors back into it. So one thing that people have been looking into recently is growing immune proteins in plants that can then be added to formula. So they'll take DNA that encodes how to, um, how to make a milk protein like lactoferrin, put in something like rice, and then be able to harvest these proteins out afterwards to add back. People are also looking into adding HMOs as prebiotics to grow healthy gut microbes. Um, but the HMOs that humans, uh, the, the milk oligosaccharides that humans make are much more complex than a lot of other species. So we can't just pull them from cows or another, uh, we'll have Right now, we have to synthesize them, uh, which is very expensive. So it's not yet feasible uh, for us to mass produce these. But people are trying to figure out how it could be. Because feeding the gut microbiota might be important for our health, which you'll find out more about if you come to the next science <laughs> newsletter. <laughs> so in summary, uh, new technologies are letting us learn a lot more about milk than we ever knew before. Um, and milk may be able to help prevent and treat diseases in the future, uh, but there are also ways that we can use milk research right now uh, to help improve the, the technologies that we already have. And what I hope you've learned tonight is that milk is the first food that mammals consume, but milk is more than food. Milk, milk helps protect against germs while the infant's own immune system develops. And in the future, we may be able to use milk's natural properties for a wide variety of products. Right, what's an acceptable level of bacteria? Right, in milk. right. Uh, so we know that milk actually has bacteria from the mother, but it's probably not going to be um, some of these things like staph or strep. Uh, I don't know exactly where we would set the baseline, but I also know that the milk, the, the milk bank milk, would be pasteurized before it's given to infants. So it's likely that these numbers for the milk bank would be drop. Okay. Yes. Um, I was just going to say, I was at a lecture that Nancy Morbacher gave a few weeks ago about milk sharing, and she addressed this study. Um, where one of the things that she said was actually that some of the methodology was a little bit shaky 
and that um, some of the milk had like, been shipped ground, and so it had been out of refrigeration for up to five days, and that um, in the, basically her point was that um, there are, there may be ways to reduce this without um, without necessarily totally restricting you know mother to mother milk sharing. It, exactly. This is this is not to say that milk sharing is, is not a good thing, just that regulations are, uh, yeah. without regulations, mm -hmm. on average. Yes? Is it known how the Hamlet molecule attacks or kills tumor cells or stroma cells? Like, why is it specific for tumor cells? Like, why, how does it identify tumor cells? Yes. I believe, is it known? Uh, I believe that it is known by normal. I do not know specifically. Um, pasteurization can damage the milk. So aren't you, isn't that sort of defeating some of the purpose of passing on the immune properties? Uh, absolutely. Pasteurization um, can kill some, can destroy some of the proteins and molecules in milk. So doesn't that defeat some of the purpose of uh, sharing for, to get the immune proteins? It, it's entirely possible. Um, it likely does, but there's the trade-off between killing the bad things and keeping the good. But could you just say a little more about that? Do you know whether pasteurization kills these particular substances? So we know that pasteurization can denature some of them, but pasteurization, it, it depends on to what temperature you go. So for many of these proteins, we know at what point they'll start to denature and no longer become active. But that's, that point isn't the same for all proteins. And so you could um, change your pasteurization process to take into account that. But I don't know if anyone is looking to how can we pasteurize um, in order to save these things. But you know, please, we could. Yes. Uh, when you talked about the, um, when you were testing on the, um, on the, um, the cells that were that were cancerous or precancerous. Mm -hmm. That was um, that was milk from a milk bank, right? I don't know where that milk oh. was coming. But but it was human milk. Uh, have have similar tests been done with say cow's milk or sheep's milk? Or? So that was a purified protein from human milk. It was not the human milk, milk directly. Okay. So, uh, so they have identified that there is a an equivalent of this protein in cows. They call it famlet. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're, they're um, I believe that people have investigated to see if it would have similar functions. But I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. So we have a question from the live feed. Um, Jan from Port Orchard, Washington, wants to know if you could talk a little bit more about how lactoferrin is harvested from rice. How, uh, how exactly lactoferrin is harvested from rice? You know, that's a great question, and I don't know exactly how they do it. Uh, I know that they can do it, and I know that they have successfully put it in for formulas, but I don't know how they get it out. Yes? In your studies as you go around, are you investigating these questions as well, like cultures that use milk as, say, uh, you know, after someone gets a cut or in different ways? And what have you found? If so? so, so far, I haven't been investigating cultures that use milk as medicine. I've had plenty of people come up to me and tell me that they've used milk to treat um, various things, um, but I, I haven't been formally studying it. Uh, any preliminary results on the research that you said you were doing in Poland versus Boston? I have, so do I have any preliminary results on the, on the research that I'm doing in Poland versus Boston? I have very, very preliminary results, um, and it looks like there might be some differences, but. I, I can't yet address the magnitude of those differences because um, I have to control for some things like mother's age and how old the infant is um, before I can say anything definitively.